The party has found themselves in Darken, one of the domains of dread, only this one is falling apart. After a cataclysmic event known to the inhabitants as the Eclipse, the mists of Ravenloft have begun encroaching on the land, slowly eroding the borders. Thorn, the whole reason the party and the town of Loudwater have found themselves in the middle of this, has a solution that involves that party chasing down three champions of the Dark Powers. Thorn suspects that part of the reason for the erosion is that the Dark Powers are contesting the land. If the champions are removed, perhaps the comatose king can awaken and restore the domain to its former glory and rid it of the curse of undeath that plagues all of the inhabitants. The party traveled to Mantira Bay, the location of one of the champions. But killing the champions is not so easy, since one would also need to destroy or capture their soul to prevent their reincarnation. Zephyr Pebblefoot has a solution, but for a price. So the party is traveling to visit the Blind Oracle to discover information, when they were attacked by a vicious guardian of the forest, nearly killing the party. How will they escape? What lies in store for the party next? Find out in movie number four of the presidential D&D campaign, coming out on June 18th, 2023. Featuring Barack the Wizard, Donatello, the greatest fighter in the world, and Joden, the ranger of the distant forest and protector of the green. Wait, protector of the green? Isn't that swamp thing from DC? I just thought I needed a bit of a catchphrase. That's a stupid catchphrase, Joe. Ignore them, Joe. It wasn't too bad. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the presidential D&D campaign, where AI-voiced U.S. presidents play Dungeons & Dragons with me, Ben Shapiro, your AI dungeon master. It's been a while since we've last left our adventurers at a bit of a predicament, and this is the first movie for the campaign that isn't a compilation of previous episodes. It's good to be back. Call of Cthulhu was a lot of fun, but I've missed playing Barack. Weren't you playing Barack in the other game, too? Well, yeah, but that one was Professor Barack, not Wizard Barack. I'm never forgiving you for betraying me in that other game. Technically, I didn't betray you. Frog Barack did. Man, maybe I do need to start trying to come up with different names. Yeah, but it was you. And you targeted me specifically because you knew I was the bigger threat. I thought he targeted you because you were standing in front of him. Yeah, that was literally the only reason. Joe was definitely the bigger threat because he had the shotgun. Whatever. I would have taken both of you in a fair fight. Honestly, the whole thing was Ben's fault. Why was it my fault? You gave us these cool new weapons to make us think there was going to be a fight, and then we never even got to use them. Yeah, because you got captured instead. Just saying, you lured us into a false sense of security and then led us right into a trap. Typical, Ben. All right, well, let's get going on our adventure in Darken, starting with our typical recap. Once again, you do find yourselves in a trap. I definitely didn't place you there, though. The creature attacking you warned you to leave his forest and you refused. Yeah, because we can take literally anything in a fair fight. It wasn't fair that you had him cast Cone of Cold before we even were able to respond or roll for initiative. And my dice were rigged, too. Wait, what happened? It has been quite a while since we posted episode seven. All right, so in that episode, you assaulted and implanted the Sight Stealer into Marcus Nightshade, a high-ranking official in the Night Watchers in Mantira Bay. It was a successful operation, with the exception that Barak was spotted. Fleeing from the town to lie low for a bit, you were on your way to the Blind Oracle to find out where Zephyr Pebblefoot's family is, when a strange figure came and told you to leave its forest. Refusing, you continued on your way, only to find him again as you were hit with a powerful cone of cold spell that almost killed all of you. So our adventure picks up there, a few miles south of Mantira Bay. The figure who had told you to leave its forest stands about 30 feet ahead, having just cast the cone of cold spell and dealing 38 damage, have to Barak and Joden, to the whole party, putting all of you in somewhat dire straits. Let's roll for initiative then. I got a 16. I got a nine. God damn it, I better start rolling better real quick here. I got an eight. This is so rigged. I got a five, so that wasn't great. You guys will all go before it does. Joden, you're up. All right, do any of you guys remember the name of my bow again? I remember it did something, but I don't quite remember what. The name is Thorn, and it adds one D6 damage to each of your shots with it. It can only be used once a day, though. Oh, that's right, so I'll activate the bow by saying Thorn, and then I want to shoot at the thing twice. That's a 24 and a 12. What do we need to hit him? You need a 16, so the 24 does hit. That's 14 damage then. Nice, all right. You let loose two arrows, the first one striking true and the second just slightly off, slicing through his billowing cape. Anything else for your turn? I want to move off into the forest, taking cover where I can. I have 35 feet of movement speed to do that. All right, you run off to the side and hide behind a fallen over tree. All right, for my turn, I want to cast Lightning Bolt at him. 
Might cause a forest fire, but honestly, he is dealing enough damage that it doesn't even really matter. He got a 13 on the spell save. Sweet, he needed a 15. That's 27 damage then. You unleash a massive lightning bolt, striking true as he tries to move out of the way. He vanishes for a second, then reappears. The heat from the bolt causes the mist to melt away, and you can see that he has pale blue skin. He begins to grow, whereas before he was the same size as a regular human, now he is about 12 feet tall. The spear in his hand, now recognizable as a glaive, grows with him. Oh damn, that's an Oni then? I'm kind of surprised that you recognized it, Joden. Well, yeah, of course I did. It must have laid claim to this forest then. We can definitely kill it, guys. Oni are typically pretty evil. That was definitely the plan, Joden. All right, I want to run off into the forest in the opposite direction of Joden and take cover over there. You guys are always hiding and just making me face the things. No matter though, I am the strongest. All right, my turn then. Finally, I will enter Bladesong just in case, but yeah, your turn, Donatello. Great. All right, you said it was 30 feet away, so I am running up to it and attacking with my longsword. All right, yeah, you can make it to him. As you get close, you see the cape is a brown hood that extends up to his head, and you can see two yellow eyes and a menacing grin hiding behind the hood. That's a 14 and an 18 to hit. What did we need again? You need a 16, so only the 18 hits there. All right, that's only nine damage. Then I'm going to action surge and attack him again. That's a 16 and a 19 on the dice, so the 19 is a critical hit. That's 31 total damage. I'll also use my second wind as a bonus action to heal back some health. That's 11 health back. Wow, all right. He takes a heavy blow as you swing and slash at him. He grunts, and you can see the grin begin to fade and be replaced by a look of worry. It is his turn now, though. Barack and Joden, I am going to have the two of you make perception checks. Joden, I think you'll have advantage because of your natural explorer thing. That's a 19 for me. Only a 14 for me. Both are good enough. You hear something running at you and are able to spin out of the way as two strange looking dogs leap at both of you. The dogs snarl, showing a lot of teeth and a maniacal grin. Long pointy ears and almost human-like eyes peer at you and they are covered in a strange, almost leathery-like skin. What the hell, do I recognize what they are? I'll let you roll for a nature check. That's another 21. You recognize them as goblin dogs, creatures that have long been extinct in the Sword Coast. Their grins and skin led people to believe that these creatures were goblins that had been transformed into beasts somehow. In actuality, they are just a rare type of mutated rodent, but were often used and trained by goblins. Well, Donatello, you're gonna have to handle the Oni by yourself. We have our hands full over here. Nothing new there. All right, so the two dogs are going to attack the two of you. That's a 17 and a 14 to hit Joden, and a six and a nine to hit Barak. What's your armor class, Joden? Mine's a 15. That's what I thought. All right, you take 10 damage as the dog tears into your arm. Damn, these things are going to kill us. That first spell from the Oni was very well done on his part. No worries, guys, we got this. I'll come and kill the dogs too once I deal with this guy. All right, for the Oni's turn, he's going to slash at you with his giant glaive. That's a 13 and an 18 for 12 total damage. Weak, I'm gonna kill it on my turn. All right, that's all for these things. Joden, you're up next. Well, I'm gonna drop my bow and swing with my short swords. I get four attacks then, one for normal, one for extra attack, one for horde breaker, and one for dual wielding. That's a nine, an 18, a 19, and another 18. So the 19 is attacking one of them and the two 18s going at the other. That's 11 at the one and nine at the other. A heavy slash to both of them have them whimpering and in a defensive posture slowly backing away with those maniacal grins staring at you. Anything else for your turn? If I run, they get attacks of opportunity on me, yeah? That's correct. All right, nothing else then. Barack, you're up. All right, well, I'm going to cast Scorching Ray at them. That's a 13, an 18, and a 17. What do I need to hit? You needed a 13, so all of those hit. Nice, all right, that's five, four, and seven damage. You could kill one of them or split up the damage? I'll kill the one. All right. You let out three rapid rays of scorching fire, leaving one a sizzling corpse and the other becomes more wary, also taking up a defensive posture. I'll also use my bonus action to cast Healing Word on Donatello. Could I do that? What's the range? 60 feet. So, for anyone new to the series, this is a bit of homebrew that we have added to the campaign. First, Barak learned Healing Word while doing a rotation at the hospital wing at the Academy of Neverwinter, even though it isn't a typical wizard spell. And second, typically wizards can only cast one spell per turn, unless they are both cantrips and one has a casting time of one bonus action. However, for this campaign, sure, Barak, you can do that. That's six hit points. Well, I'll take it, I guess. I'm gonna kill this guy, though. My turn, then? Yeah, your turn. All right, I'm doing what I always do. 
That's a 24 and a 21 for a total of 22 damage. He's looking extremely wounded. All right, for his turn, he is going to slash at Donatello again with his glaive. That's a 26 and a 21, so both of those are going to hit you, Donatello, for a total of 24 damage. Damn. All right, it pains me to say it, but thanks for the health, Barack. I'm at three now, so I would be down. Then the two dogs are going to strike at Joden, and the other one is going to attack Barack. That's a 23 and a 6 to hit Joden, and a 12 to hit Barack. Joden, that's eight damage. Damn, I'm almost dead too. The two dogs are then going to run away. Joden, you'll have an opportunity attack. All right, I'll swing at the one that I did more damage to. That's a 21 for seven damage. That does kill the one dog. The other is able to make it 45 feet away into the forest. What about you, Barack? You can make an opportunity attack against the one that is running away from you as well. I don't even have my scimitar out and he is at full health. I'll just forego my opportunity attack. All right, that is it for my turn. Joden, you're up next. I'll pick up my bow again and shoot at the Oni. Hell no, this is my kill. We don't even know how hurt he is. Ben said he was extremely wounded. I swear, Joden, if you kill him, I'm going to kill you. I'm still shooting at him. That's a 17 for eight damage. That does finish him off. God damn it, Joden. You're welcome. I had it handled. You just stole all my glory. You're lucky that I'm a nice guy. Otherwise, I'd have killed you for that. Relax, Donatello. We all know that you did most of the damage here for real this time. Yeah, I did. And everyone out there better know it. They do. All right, so kind of a weird and gruesome question. But I know in a lot of places you can sell goblin ears for money. Do they do that for these two dead dogs? They could. You'd have to ask one of the locals if you want to try. You would have to carry some bloody ears all the way back with you. Okay, I don't think that's worth it. That was a pretty close combat, guys. Maybe for you guys, I'm still doing fine. You're literally at three health. I'm only at 11. And Barack, what are you at? I'm at 19. That spell did exactly half my health. Luckily, none of the dogs hit me. Yeah, I rolled pretty bad against you, Barack. I rolled great against Joden and Donatello, though. Yeah, that was a close one. Well, the sun has begun to rise following the combat, and the mists begin to lessen. You can see the green of the trees and can even see all the way out to the sea. The dead body of the Oni, a towering 15-foot-tall, blue-skinned creature, rests with the glaive beside it. What do you guys want to do? Can I take the glaive? You aren't able to wield it effectively. It's definitely made for a giant. So is the Oni a spirit then? It didn't leave footprints, but it does have a physical body. It is basically just a magical ogre. A lot of times they are even called ogre mages. Typically they use their magic to abduct people, but this one apparently laid claim to this forest and saw you as trespassers. It was using its magic and the mist to appear incorporeal and hide its footprints. I see, interesting. Do they typically work alone? They can. They also form tribes on occasion or have been known to work for other typically evil aligned creatures if the pay or rewards are great enough. Oni love their treasures and their food. Well, I think we need to take a rest. Even if it is just a short rest, but I'd prefer a long one. Even if it postpones making it to the Oracle. Agreed. All right, since it looks like you guys need it, we can take a long rest then. You find a small little grove and rest up, taking turns being on watch. Your rations are beginning to run low, but Joden is also able to effectively find a lot of food in the forest, so you don't really have to worry about that. All right, everyone can gain the benefits of a long rest, and I think we should also level up to level seven then. Hell yeah, I better get a better roll on the hit dice this time. I need more health if I'm going to continue tanking all of this damage for you two. All right, I rolled a seven. Not terrible, I only get this remarkable athlete thing. That was already true, and it doesn't look like it does a whole lot. Just lets me add half my proficiency bonus to some things and add some feet if I am jumping. I'm just doing the average hit points. I am up to 60 now, so that's not bad. I also get multi-attack defense, which buffs my AC when someone attacks me more than once in a turn. I gain my first slot of level 4 spells. I'm taking Storm Sphere, and then I'm also learning Disguise Self for when we return to Mantira Bay. I'll have to use that to hide from the Night Watchers. Okay, great. I think that is everything for the level up then. If everyone also healed back up to full Barak, you can recover your spell slots and everyone can refresh all abilities. Then we can move on. All right, let's get heading to this Blind Oracle guy then. So I think Zephyr said that the Blind Oracle had spent some time in the Feywild, yeah? Ben, do I know anything about that? I can tell you all about it. It's a plane of unrestrained beauty. Pretty much back when the planes were formed, the Feywild, the Material Plane, and the Shadowfell were all duplicates of each other. But different magics went to different ones. So the Feywild became suffused with potent magic, which led to the creation of the Fey. The Shadowfell became a dark reflection of that, and then the Material Plane got a balance of the two. I didn't realize Donatello had that much experience with the different planes. He's definitely metagaming again. Yeah, that's what Ben was getting at. 
Yeah. So, Barak, since you're an elf, you do know all of that, since the elves are part of the Fae that came to the material plane. I'm not metagaming. Donatello is a fighter and a scholar. He's the smartest person alive, probably. You wouldn't just know all of that about the Feywild, Shadowfell, and Material Plane without making a role or having studied somewhere or having some reason to know it beyond I'm smart. Maybe you wouldn't. All right, anyway, so, Barak, you also know that time does pass differently in the Feywild. You've heard of elves that swear they were only gone for a day or two that had vanished for centuries or the opposite, where one leaves for a day and comes back centuries older. The same is true for the Shadowfell, where you guys are at now, actually. So it could have been a hundred years in the Material Plane already. Damn, that's trippy. Yeah, all right, anyways, just wanted to see if I knew anything before we continued on to the cave place. It's about midday when you begin traveling again, the mists receding slightly and allowing you to more clearly see your surroundings. Before we leave too, are you sure, Ben, that I can't wield the Oni's weapon? I have an 18 strength. Even if you could, you'd have disadvantage on every attack since it is made for a giant. Though, as the three of you head back to where you had killed the Oni, you don't find its body or the weapon. Damn it, I bet Joden didn't even kill it. I definitely killed it. Anyways, you were right up there. If it wasn't dead, why didn't you kill it? Are there any tracks or anything leading away, Ben? I'll let you guys roll for perception or nature to try to find a trail. That's only a 13. Hey, I got a 13 too. And once again, I reign supreme. That's a 15. Donatello, you notice that there are a lot of branches and things moved about as if someone was covering their tracks. They did a really good job though, and you are able to see that the rough direction is towards Mantira Bay, but can't make out much more than that. Damn. So either it walked away and for some reason covered its tracks even though it was able to not leave footprints before, or someone took the body and the weapon and then covered up their tracks. Are Oni bodies worth anything? The weapon probably was, even if the body isn't. That was my damn weapon. I'm gonna kill whoever it was that took it. This means we have bigger problems though, guys. Either something was able to find this body in the middle of nowhere by luck, or someone was able to follow us through the mists without us realizing it. They could still be following us now. They have a death wish then. Can I roll for perception to see if I can spot anyone around us, Ben? Maybe hiding somewhere? Sure, go for it. That's a 21. You don't see anyone around you, even through the mists. You are pretty confident that you are alone, at least at the moment. See, nothing to worry about. Though yeah, someone was probably following us. Or maybe the Oni had some servants or friends that came and took the body and didn't want us to follow them. That could have happened. All right, anyways, we should definitely get on the road back down towards the Blind Oracle. Agreed. Now that the Oni is dead, or hopefully at least, we should definitely keep traveling in the forest, yeah? Though obviously staying somewhat close to the coast so that we don't miss the cove in the cave. Yeah, all right. Now that I'm a level seven, we better have another fight soon, Ben. Don't worry, Donatello. I'm sure there'll be more combat soon. All right, the three of you continue following down the coast, feeling a lot better after you were able to rest. The traveling is rather uneventful in the daytime. You hear creatures in the forest, but they definitely give you a wide berth as you continue onward. The sun begins to set on the distant horizon as you finally reach the cove. A large river pours out into the ocean, the fresh water from somewhere inland merging into the salty sea. You see a large cave entrance, probably about 20 feet tall with a pair of large torches on either side of it. You also see a large ship in the cove, shipwrecked and decaying, the back half submerged in the tide. Well, we are definitely going there after the Blind Oracle. Why? Treasure. Can you imagine what must be on that ship? I wonder if it's actually how the Oracle got here. Perhaps the Shadow Shippers traveled from the Feywild and the Oracle came with? I don't know how you come up with this stuff, Joden. Half the time it sounds like you are an idiot and then you say something that actually could make a lot of sense. It's just how I roll. Whatever, it wasn't that impressive. I could have come up with that too. You didn't though. All right, to the cave first though. I don't think it's a great idea to be in this cove at night. We still don't really know what all is out here. Yeah, let's go. You approach the cave entrance, finding more torches lighting the way inward. A long passageway begins to open up into a large cavern with a throne carved into the rock on the far side. You see a large figure sitting on the throne and feel an intense stare as you enter. Damn, this is a trap for sure. Not everything is a trap, Donatello. You say that literally every time we go anywhere. And I'm right every time. Can I ready my longsword, Ben? Sure. As you reach for it, the figure says, I have waited a long time for our reunion adventurers. We have both traveled far. Let us not sully our acquaintance with further violence. Wait, we know this guy? Yes, we have met before. Long ago, though perhaps not for you. The figure begins to stand and the ground shakes beneath its weight. Oh, it's Lug. Yes, in front of you. Eyeless, but appearing to be quite a bit more formidable as when you last saw him, stands Lug, the hill giant who you stabbed in the eyes like Odysseus and the Cyclops. I'm drawing my sword. He chuckles. Do not worry. 
I bear no ill will towards you. Though yes, it is because of you that I was separated from my beloved Henrietta, doomed to walk the forbidden lands of the Feywild for many years. But it is also because of you that I gain power and knowledge, enough to see into the future and overcome my inner nature. Why should we believe you? It sounds like you blame us for a lot of things. Just gaining power and knowledge isn't enough to offset that. Sitting back on the throne, he raises a hand to his chin. Yes, I suppose you are right. Do not misunderstand me. I have not forgiven your trespasses. But I do see the bigger picture now. The Fae blessed me to see the future, and I understand your purpose. Besides, if we did come to blows, you would best me. I am not prideful enough to fight you, though I suppose I could have arranged for significant traps to have turned the tide in my favor. I have looked forward to our meeting for quite some time now. How long has it been for you? For us, it's been like maybe a week. It has been many years since we met for me. Time passes exceedingly fast in the Feywild. I do not even know for how long I wandered, lost in the dark, before the lady found me. Who was it that found you then, and gave you these powers? I do not know. All that she said is that she saw great things in my future and opened my mind to see it as well. Then I traveled here, waiting for your arrival so that the events of the future can unfold. And what are the events of the future? If I told you, it may not come to pass. We could beat it out of you. You said that we would win in a fight. You could try, though I did not mean to say that all of you would walk away. But again, I do not wish to fight. All right, well, we came here to ask if you know where Zephyr Pebblefoot's family is at. He sent us here to ask you. Indeed, they are here as a matter of fact. In your cave? No, not in my cave, you fool. My apologies, I did not mean to speak so harshly. Sometimes I must restrain my more crude nature. All right, that's it. Nobody calls me a fool and gets away with it. Shut up, Donald, he's still a hill giant. Makes sense that he still has aggressive tendencies. To paraphrase a wise dragon, what is greater? To be born evil or to overcome evil through great effort? Hey, that's from Skyrim. Lug looks at you curiously. I do not know of this land that you speak. It was a fairy dragon that I met in the Feywild that spoke those words to me, though perhaps he had heard it from somewhere else. So where is his family if not here then? They were captured by a paladin, Sir Morgrim the Fallen, in his conquest that led to him traveling here to Darken. He lives in Illaluk, in one of the mansions of the Ashen Hollow District to the south of the city. I believe that Zephyr would like to know that they are no longer alive. Nothing in Illaluk is, but they are there as slaves of Morgrim. So they're zombies now? I believe they prefer the term undead, but that is a trivial local quirk. Yes, they are zombies, though that may not bother Zephyr. Most of his business is with the undead. Interesting. And what about the shipwreck outside? I would not travel there if I was you, though you would find items of value and I know how much you like shiny things. Donatello of Trumpville. You three would have your work cut out for you if you step on board its cursed decks. What, ghosts or something? Or something. But for now, I have arranged bedding for you three and there is food as well. I would recommend getting some rest while you can. You have trying times ahead of you. Why are you helping us, Lug? What are you getting out of this? My reasons are my own, though I will ask a favor in return. What favor? I know that you are in Mantira Bay looking to destroy the Night Watchers, or at the very least, Baron Metis. The Royal Ambassador's plan is a solid one, and one that would heal the land from its seeping wounds. The Baron has in their possession a magical orb of seeing. It is what has allowed them to crush the resistance beneath their feet, all but a select few, that is. They need somewhere for rebels to gather, so they leave a few alive and well, recruiting to their cause. Bring me the orb following your quest, and we shall be even. If they have that orb, then that means that they know we are coming, right? That's not good. They could be on their way here now. Indeed they could, but nobody can scry within my walls. But they can once we leave. They could ambush us in the forest on our way back. To assuage your worries, I can give you a warding stone. It would prevent anyone from scrying you, though, for better or for worse. Why would that be for worse? I don't think we want anyone scrying us. You do not only have enemies within the boundaries of this festering land, there are those who would see your success. Who? You shall have to find them yourselves, I am afraid. Though I can tell you that Thorn and Zephyr are both allies to your cause, though both have their own motives as well. Yeah, yeah, everyone has their own motives. You're saying you're not an ally to our cause then? I am not, though I am not an enemy either. I am simply a watcher. I care not for the land of Darken or those puny humans from Loudwater. All of these things are but whispers in the wind, gone before one has the chance to blink. Are you immortal now then? No, though I will live for a very long time and I suspect that it will be for far longer than the three of you. You lead a dangerous life and actively seek that which would destroy you. Tell me, have you heard the whispers in the night yet? The beckonings of invisible beings offering power and knowledge? You will. Ravenloft is built upon them. What do you mean? My apologies, I do not mean to worry you, but I do seek to warn you that with all power comes a very real cost. But such power may be necessary to you accomplishing your goals. Now the three of you must rest. I know you seek to enter the ship tomorrow, and the day after you must return to Mantira Bay. 
else you will be too late, as Zephyr will be leaving that night. If he departs through the mists, then your quest will be delayed, and the punishment severe. You're saying you're going to punish us? Wait, why should we go to the shipwreck then? Shouldn't we just head back up to Mantira Bay? We have the information we need, I don't think we should risk Zephyr leaving. I will not punish you, no. But the Baron and his Night Watchers are aware that there are dangers in the land. Once the Shadow Shippers leave port, you will be immediately recognized as outsiders, and without a means to stop the Baron. Oh, okay, that makes sense. So we should leave tomorrow then, yeah? And not risk Zephyr leaving before we are able to get back there? Ain't no way in hell that I am leaving without exploring that shipwreck. Not only did Ben put it there, but also Lug said that there are valuables on board. Besides, if we were going to die, then Lug would tell us. That sounds good to me. I could use some enchanted short swords. This is stupid. Doesn't matter, you're outvoted. Do we die on the shipwreck tomorrow, Lug? You could die. You could die tonight. You could simply pull out a sword and plunge it into your own heart, and I would not have seen it coming. I see possibilities, and sort through to find ones of greater import. No, I do not believe that you would die on the ship, though there are things worse than death in Ravenloft. See, we shouldn't go. He said we probably aren't gonna die. Maybe there's even better armor for you on board the ship. Yeah, I think it's a dumb idea, but we should do it. Okay, fine, whatever. Just pointing out that you guys are idiots. Well, Joe is. I'm a genius. That's the most ridiculous thing you've said this session. All right, Lug, can we get those warding stones then? They will make it so that nobody can scry us, yeah? Yes, of course. Lug reaches into a pocket and produces a couple of stones. Nothing more than small pieces of gravel in his hand, but a decent-sized rock in yours. You can feel a magical ward pass over you as you take it from him. All right, should we eat food and then go to bed then? Sounds good. All right. Lug points out a side passage. Much too small for him to travel through, you notice, but you find several beds, hot baths, and food waiting for you at the end of the hall. It is the nicest place that you have stayed in a long time. Hell yeah. That's strange. How would Lug have set this up if he couldn't fit in the hallway? Servants? Lug is the type to have servants for sure. He's like some sort of super genius hill giant now. He could figure it out. I guess that could be true. Anyways, I just had a thought, actually. Do you guys think the Sight Stealer would be able to restore Lug's eyesight? Huh, that's a good question. I don't think they could cure blindness, but Lug's eyes worked fine until we stabbed them out. I had that idea a while ago, but I didn't say anything, just saying it was my idea. Ben? You could try it for sure in the morning, probably. Unless you wanted to go back to the main cavern tonight. Yeah, morning is fine. On to more important matters, though. And speaking of the Sight Stealer, Ben, do I see anything in the stone for Marcus? Pulling out the stone, you see a room with probably 20 or 30 hooded figures. Marcus looks to be standing on some sort of stage at the front of the room, and there is a man wearing an obsidian crown addressing the crowd. We can't hear anything though, yeah? Just see? Yeah, you can only see the room. Could we take turns watching to try to get an idea of where in the town they are located? Sure, you can do that. Is there anything else you guys wanted to do throughout the night? I don't think so. I have a good spell set, so I don't think I need to swap any of them out or anything. I want to search more for that gold teapot. What the hell happened to it? Pulling out your gold pouch, where you are almost certain you stashed the teapot, you find nothing. Then, with a sudden jolt of pain, you feel something bite your finger, dealing one point of damage. A mimic? I want to dump out the bag of gold, all 150 pieces. Wow, we've almost caught up to you, Donatello. I have 140 gold. And we have more shadow shards now, too, since you spent the most on your little sword. Whatever, I have more in the bank. You guys are still much poorer than me. I don't think there are banks. There are in Trumpville. I own them. That feels like a lie. You guys are the liars. I've never told a lie before. Anyways, Ben, what the hell bit me? Looking at it now, it is just a pile of gold coins. I'm going to start stabbing them then. As you start stabbing them, one by one, there's a flurry of movement all of the sudden, and you see a small reptilian-looking face looking up at you, hissing and gathering up all of your gold coins. What the hell is it? Do I know Ben? Or me, this is clearly a magical creature, yeah? Joden, you can roll for nature, Barak. You can roll for Arcana. Hell yeah, that's a natural 20 for a 23 total. Nice, Joden. I got a 19. Joden, you recognize it as a gold pseudo-dragon, Barak. You do as well. They are used as familiars a lot of the time and are typically shy and playful. Though neither of you have ever heard of a gold one before. Either of you speak draconic? I do. Hey, what are you? And why were you in Donatello's bag? Hell no, I'm killing it. I don't care what it is. It's been in my bag this whole time. Pseudo-dragons are nice, though, Donatello. Typically. Sometimes, I guess. Joe, you hear a quiet reptilian voice in Draconic in your mind. My horde, mine. See? Time to kill this thing. Well, you did toss it into your gold pouch. I guess that means it's his now. Hell no, you guys give it your gold if you're so inclined to keep it. I'm taking my gold back. Ben, I want to take my gold back. As you reach down to start picking up your gold, you see a small spout of flames leap out of its mouth, 
dealing two fire damage to your hand, Donatello. It hisses and curls up, gathering up the rest of the coins. Joden, you hear that voice again in your head. Mine. This is mine. That's it. I'm swinging with my sword, Ben. I want to move to stop him. Yeah, me too. All right, Donatello, you can still swing, but you'll have disadvantage. I don't care. This thing bit me. It has probably stolen all my gold, and now it burned me too. All right, Joden and I have almost as much gold as you had. We'll split all of the gold we have remaining among the three of us, and just let this dragon keep his gold. He could be useful if he is on our side. Oh yeah? And how do you suggest we get him on our side? All he wants is the gold. Hey, we can give you more gold if you're on our side. It looks up at you curiously. More gold? Yeah, lots more. But only if you travel with us and help us out. It nods its little head. For more gold. All right, even if it is on our team, how could it even help us? Apparently it can polymorph or something. It was a teapot initially, and then it became either a coin or a bunch of coins. Could be useful. How big is it, Ben? It's about the size of the teapot, which was pretty small. Whatever. Fine, give me your gold and we can take him with us. The gold isn't worth that much here either, Donatello. We pretty much just use shadow shards. Besides, I thought you were rich. I'll give Donatello 50 gold pieces. Yeah, I thought you were rich. I'm rich because I don't go around giving away 150 gold pieces to dragons. Giving is a good thing, Donatello. I'll give you 50 gold pieces too, though. That makes us all about even around 100 gold, yeah? Yeah, I'm at 90. You're still the richest, Donatello. I know you guys are trying to make me out to be the bad guy, but you'd be doing the same thing if a dragon just laid claim to all of your gold. It's not smart business to not do what I did. Whatever, Donatello. Anyways, what's your name, little guy? Master calls me Nugget. Who is your master? Master is... Master? Master is evil. Nugget hate master. Interesting. Perhaps the halflings that were stealing the cabbages then. That's where we found the teapot. I didn't think they were evil, though. Yeah, and it also looked like a family heirloom. Nugget could have been disguised as that teapot for a while by the time we stole him. All right, we didn't steal him. We simply were taking a reward for clearing the giants out for the halflings. That's actually when we found Lug then. Yeah, that's true. His master could be anybody, really. Anyways, are you ready for the next day then? One last thing before we go to bed. I want to ask Nugget if he can transform into anything or what all he can transform into. His little reptilian face scrunches up in concentration and his scales become solid and within just a second or two, you see a gold teapot. Then a few seconds later, he becomes a pile of coins again. Then a golden chalice. Finally, a gold bar. Barak, can you make a history check? Damn, that's a nine. You feel like there is something you can't quite remember, something that is right on the tip of your remembrance, but that just isn't quite coming into focus. That was strange. I wonder what it is that I can't remember. I have a plus seven to my history. That was pretty lame. I only rolled a two. Probably that pseudo dragons are evil and that it is going to kill us. I'm telling you guys, I don't trust this nugget at all. Any payments we are giving to him is coming out of your guys' shares. Whatever he transforms into must be gold then? Interesting. We'll have to see how he can come in handy later. See, all you guys want is a little slave type thing. You make it sound like I'm the bad guy, but at least I don't want to use him for free labor. We aren't using him for free labor. We are going to pay him. Sure you are. Anyways, we are sleeping then? Yeah, that sounds good. And taking turns watching the stone. All right, this seems like a good place to slip in a one-shot type adventure. Barak, since you are an elf and meditate instead of sleep, as you go into your trance, you find yourself whisked away to your days at the academy, specifically on a momentous day towards the end of your schooling there. So, does everyone have the character sheet and backstory I gave them? Other than Obama, of course, you're still playing as Barack. Yeah, so I am playing as Varys, one of the soon-to-be graduating class from the Vanguard Institute in Neverwinter. I'm a human barbarian, though, not a fighter, trying to switch things up a bit. I must say, I actually thought at the beginning of the campaign that you would have been a barbarian instead of a fighter. I am much too disciplined for my main character to be a mindless barbarian. But all you do is run up and attack with your sword. Yeah, because I am the best fighter in the world. Would you all prefer I just hung back and did nothing instead? All right, and Joe, your character? I'm playing as Brahm, a newly ordained dragonborn cleric from the Scholars of Devotion, a sect of clerics that seek to increase the knowledge of your average layperson in matters of celestial, abyssal, and demonic entities and powers. So this is taking place during the end of my schooling at the Academy? I've been there for about three years then. Correct. So the three of you have known each other for a while. The academies and the scholars do a lot of work and training together to provide a well-rounded education to their students. This particular day has the three of you outside of Neverwinter, actually, deep in the heart of Neverwinter Woods, on a training and fact-finding mission. There are rumors of a growing cult of demon worshippers that have been kidnapping travelers and sacrificing them in an attempt to open a portal to the Abyss. Also, 
As a slight immersion issue, similar to the day in Trumpville one-shot, even though this takes place in the past, everyone is still a level seven. Let's kill these demon cultists then. I'm guessing it won't be quite that easy. We need to find them first. Brom, you're the demon expert, right? I guess that's right. Ben, can I make a nature or perception check to get a bearing on where the cultists could be? Sure, I'll even give you advantage on the check since you have a lot of training in matters like this. That's a dirty 20. Thinking through your training, you know that rituals like this would likely be located somewhere close to a body of water for ritual needs, but also dark and secluded. Since you were born in Neverwinter and have spent a lot of time in the forest, you know of a small pool with a cave nearby that would work perfectly. That's even where you have been leading the group towards for a while now. All right, let's get a move on though. I am ready to kill these cultists and finally graduate from the Damned Institute. Way too much schooling for me. Good schooling though, right? Help you control that rage a bit? I don't have a problem with rage. You'll be thanking my rage once we get to this cultist place. Right, no problem with rage at all, Varus. You reach the cave just as the sun is setting on the horizon. You can see torchlight flickering within the cave as well. It looks like you've arrived at the correct location. All right, guys, remember what happened in the Call of Cthulhu campaign. Not only do we need to kill the cultists, but we probably need to mess up the sacrifices or altar and magic or whatever. We aren't going to take another victory where it turns out we also gave them what they needed for the ritual. That's metagaming, but yeah, definitely. First we destroy the altar or magic circle and then we take out the cultists. Sounds like a plan. All right, as you move into the cave, you see a cluster of cultists around a large altar made of bone and covered in blood. You see a young man bound and tied to the top of it, struggling as one of the cultists, the only one in a deep red robe, carves an arcane symbol into his chest with a ceremonial blade. It looks like you have made it here just in the nick of time. Damn, I can't fireball with them being so close to the guy. He is still alive, yeah, Ben? He is for sure, a look of sheer terror and pain on his face. As you enter, one of the cultists sees you as well, turning and shouting out to the others. Let's roll for initiative. Damn, I rolled a nat one, that's a two total. Today is just not my day. I got a 10. Hell yeah, I got a 14, so I'm going first then. Not so fast, I got a 15, so the cultists are actually going to spring into action. The leader is going to continue his work on the man, while there are a total of eight other cultists who are going to rush at you with ceremonial knives held high. They each have two attacks, and so three of them are going after Varus, three after Brahm, and two after Barak. That's a 21, another 21, a nine, another nine, an eight, and a 23 to hit Varus. What's your armor class? Damn, only a 15, that's not great. Three of those hit then. That's a total of 23 damage then. All right, guys, this is a fight for real then. We need to take out these cultists fast, otherwise they are going to chop us up. I got my rage though, so we'll be fine. All right, Brom, that's a 7, 5, 22, 12, dirty 20, and 13 to hit you. What's your armor class? Mine's an 18 this time. Liar. No, for reals, I have chain mail and a shield. I think the same as what Donatello has. Oh, so you're just copying me now? Anyways, that's a total of nine damage to you. Finally, Barak, the two are going to attack you. That's a 21, a five, another 21, and a seven to hit you. So two of those hit, dealing a total of nine damage, same as Brahm. I'm not quite sure how this is going to be fitting into the pseudo dragon we found, guys, but we need to kill these cultists. No shit, Sherlock, of course we need to kill the cultists. All right, is it my turn, Ben? The lead cultist continues carving into the man on the altar as he screams out in pain. Yeah, it's your turn now. All right, I'm raging and I'm going into a frenzy too. Finally, before I swing at the first cultist, I'm going to use my great weapon master feat to subtract five from all my attack rolls, but I get to add 10 damage if I land the hit. Oh wow, that's a lot of damage. Hell yeah it is, and I get advantage from the rage, right? Only if you choose to reckless attack and only for the first attack. Then anybody who attacks you will get advantage on their roll too. Well, I'm doing it. That's a 21 minus five, so 16, does that hit? Yeah, that hits. That's 23 damage then. All right, then I get to attack again, and I'm doing the subtract five thing again. Damn, these dice are rigged. That was a 10, so only a five. All right, with the first swing, you cut straight through the cultist, but it puts you off balance. As you swing again, the second cultist is able to dodge out of the way. All right, I'll take it. I'm raging too, so I take half damage, yeah? That's right, and after this, you can attack a third time per turn too. All right, Brom, you're up next. All right, I'm gonna use my breath weapon, I think. How many cultists could I fit in a five by 30 foot line? It's a line, not a cone. Well then, if you let one of them make an attack of opportunity, I'll say you could get into position to make it against the remaining seven. Deal. That's a 19 to hit for seven damage. Damn, all right, now they all need to make a dex saving throw though. That's a eight for the first two, an 11 for the second three, 
and then a 17 for the final two. What's the save DC? It says 13 and half damage to those that succeeded. So it's 14 damage to all of them, but only seven to those that succeeded. All right, they're all still alive, but they are wounded as you unleash a... What type of breath does it say for copper? Acid. As you unleash an acidic stream of copper liquid. Anything else for your turn? I guess I'll also use healing word on Donald. Sorry, I mean Varus as a third level spell. Healing for 10 points. Not necessary, but all right. Okay, Barak, you're up next. If I cast Burning Hands, would it extend far enough to hit the head cultist performing the ritual? It can, but you would only be able to hit the two cultists in front of you in that case. All right, let's do that then, as a level three spell. They need to make another dexterity saving throw. Damn, that's a six and a nine for the two in front of you. It's a 22 for the head cultist, though. That's 16 total damage. Flames erupt out of your hands, melting the faces of the two cultists in front of you as they were still off balance from Brahm's breath weapon and igniting the robe of the head cultist. He ignores the pain, though, continuing to frantically carve into the chest of the man. You will never stop us, he cries out, voice shrill and unearthly. All right, it is the cultist's turns again. I believe there are still two of them on Varus and three on Brahm, yeah? Damn, yeah, still the two of them on me. Did I not kill any of them? I don't think so. You did hurt all of them, but didn't finish any of them off. All right, so the two cultists are going to attack Varus first. That's a six, an 11, a nine, and a 15. And that was with advantage on each of them. Damn, that was pretty terrible rolling. My armor class is a 15, so only one of those hit. All right, so that is eight damage, which is halved because of your rage, so four damage. Then the three are going to slash at Brom. That's a five, a seven, an 11, an eight, a 20, and a 23. So only two of those hit for a total of 13 damage. With that, the head cultist is going to cry out in an arcane language, plunging the dagger down into the chest of the sacrifice. As you watch in abject horror, the altar begins sinking in a bubbling pool of crimson liquid. The remaining five cultists close to you are going to turn and fall to their knees, bowing to the pool. You see a demonic hand reach out, grabbing onto the stone floor and begin climbing out of the abyss. Thin spiked protrude from its arms, back, and shoulders, and a pair of horns are the first thing you see on its reptilian and draconic face. You all will have one more turn before it fully emerges. Damn. All right, guys, we gotta kill this thing and seal that portal. Otherwise, we will have a full incursion on our hands. Yeah, yeah, demons are bad, we get it. No, Barak is right. If that portal isn't closed, then it will continue to spread and fester, allowing more and more demons into our world. Why did they only send three students to investigate this? Well, it's not often that someone actually does open a portal to the abyss. Most of the time, they don't have the arcane knowledge or components to successfully do that. Varus, you need to go kill that head cultist. He could be a powerful wizard. I can do that. All right, for my turn, Ben, I want to run up and slash at the head cultist guy. All right, do you want to use your great weapon thing? I do for the first one with advantage because I am also reckless attacking. That's a 15. That barely hits. You needed a 15. Damn it, I only rolled a one on the damage die. That's 17 damage then. You rolled a one and still did 17 damage? Yeah, it would have been like 30 damage. Wow, this guy seems stronger than Donatello. You shut your damn mouth. Donatello is the greatest fighter in all of the Sword Coast. Though in his absence, I am willing to say that Varus is a close second, which is why I am playing him, of course. All right, I'm swinging again. I guess I'll still do the great weapon fighting on this and on my bonus action. God damn it, after subtracting the five, that's a 10 and a five. That wasn't great. Yeah, but still, it was something. All right, Brahm's turn. I kind of wish I had gone before Varus, but I'm going to try to use confusion on the whole area with the demon and the head cultist. It only has a 10 foot radius. Can I do that where it wouldn't hit Donald? I'll say you can. You can aim the center of the spell behind the altar against the wall, and Varus will be out of the range. Sweet, all right, so the creatures within that range need to make a wisdom saving throw or be confused. That's a dirty 20 for the cultist, but only a 12 for the demon. What was the save DC? 14. So on the demon's turn, it needs to roll a D10 to see what it has to do or act like. Then it gets to redo the save, and if it succeeds, the spell ends. Okay, that sounds good. Anything else, or is it Barak's turn? That's it for me. All right. I still have a bad feeling about that head cultist, and I think he will be easier to deal with than the demon. So I'll cast Scorching Ray as a third level, getting four attacks off of that. If the head cultist dies, then I'll have the other ones go to the demon. Is that okay, Ben? Sure, I'll allow that. That's a 21, another 21, a 26, and an 11 for 10, then four, then five damage. All right, so with 19 damage total, you do manage to finish off the head priest. Launching four incendiary rays of fire at him and only missing one, the priest stumbles backwards, three holes in his chest. He slumps against the cave wall, dead. 
With this, the other cultists are going to be shaken from their religious revelry and turn to attack Barak and Brahm. Oh shit, I had kind of forgotten about them. All right, Varys, you're up with killing that demon thing. Hopefully the confusion helps a bit. All right, let's do the cultists first, and then we can do the demon. Sorry, on my turn, could I also enter Bladesong? Yeah, for sure. All right, so the two cultists that had been attacking Varys are going to attack Barak, and Brom, you still have three of the cultists on you. Barak, that's a 15, an 18, a 22, and a natural 20. What's your AC? With Bladesong, it's a 16, so that's a lot of damage. Yeah, so that's 26 damage. Damn, could have been worse, but that was a heavy hit. Then for Brom, it's an 8, a 9, a 23, a 13, an 11, and a final 9. So only one of those hit, dealing 6 damage. Since you are also in concentration for the spell still, you will need to roll a constitution saving throw to maintain concentration. The rules are that you need either a 10 or half of the damage taken, whichever is higher. So that's a 10 in this case. That's an 11. Dang, that was a close one. Nicely done. All right, the demon will be confused on its turn then. The fact that they get two attacks each and there are so many of them isn't really fair. Agreed, that's a lot of damage they are pushing through. What's their damage, die, Ben? It's just 1d6. Wait until you see the demon, though. All right, so the demon, Brom, you recognize it as a Glabrizu, finished clambering out of the pit to the abyss. That's a three on the confusion check, though. What effect does that have? Nice, so that means it can't move or take any actions this turn. Oh, all right then, that's pretty good. All right, so now I get to make the wisdom saving throw again. Damn, that's only a 10. It'll be confused for its next turn as well then. If I take damage and the concentration ends, would it still be confused for that turn or would it end immediately? Typically, it would end immediately. But since I take all of the enemy turns at the same time, I'll say that it goes for one more turn. All right, Varys, you're up next. It's about damn time. All right, time to show this demon what a barbarian is made of. I'll swing at it three times, the first using my reckless attack and great weapon master feat, the other two just normal. Hell yeah, that is a critical hit, natural 20. I am literally the greatest even when I am not playing as my character. Damn, nice job. All right, you'll add 20 to the hit then off of that. That's 49 total damage. Holy shit, that's a lot of damage off of a single swing. Hell yeah it is, that's what I'm talking about. You swing at it with all your might, leaving a long gash across its scaly chest. It shrieks in rage and pain. All right, you still have your other two attacks too. That's a nine, which I'm guessing misses, and a 26 for 13 damage. What's the armor class? It has a 17 armor class. All right, so you did 62 points of non-magical damage. That's pretty impressive. God damn it, Ben, why'd you say it like that? Is it immune to non-magical damage or something like that? That would be total horse shit. It has resistance, but not immunity. But since you rolled a critical, I let that part deal full damage. Hell yeah, thanks, Ben. Knew you were good for something. Thanks, I think. All right, Brom, your turn next. All right, I don't have a lot I can do, but I will cast Guiding Bolt at the demon, I think. Damn, that's only a 14 to hit. Then I guess I'll use my bonus action to cast Healing Word and heal for... Nine damage. Barak, you gotta kill these guys. Otherwise, we're gonna die before the demon even finishes. It's confusion. Yeah, I think I am gonna cast Burning Hands using a second level spell slot on the cultists. They're all injured, right, Ben? Yeah, they are all still injured from Brahm's breath weapon. All right, so they need to make dexterity saving throws then. I'll roll once for the cultists in front of you, and then once for the ones in front of Brom. Holy hell, that's a natural one for both of them. I'll say that you can roll for a critical strike. Hell yeah, so that is 40 damage then. Nice. All right, you completely melt the cultists in an act of pure magic, the walls and floor turning into molten slag from the heat of the combustion. Anything else? How much health are you at, Brom? I'm at 30. All right, I'll use a second level spell to cast Healing Word on myself then. That's another eight points of damage. All right, it is the demon's turn then. I'll roll for confusion first. That's an eight. All right, so according to this, it can make a melee attack against a random creature within its range. Damn, that's only Varus then. All right, so it is going to swing at Varus. It only gets the one attack, not its usual four. It normally gets four attacks? Yeah, normally. So it also gets advantage on Varus since you used your reckless attack. That's a 25 to hit for 16 bludgeoning damage, which is halved for you as well. And it is going to pick you up Varus, grappling you. Hell no, he didn't. All right, what does grapple do? In this case, it just sets your speed equal to zero. You can still attack it if you want. Of course I want to. All right, first I need to roll for its wisdom saving throw. That's a 19, so it is free from the confusion. That ends its turn as well, so it just reached out and grabbed Varus, stabbing him with its claws and the spikes protruding from its body. Time for it to die. I'll reckless attack and use my great weapon master thing again. That's a 21 to hit, dealing 24 damage. 
Then for the other two attacks, it's an 18 and an 11 for 19 damage. All right, it is still able to maintain its grip on you as you swing your great axe at it again. Brom, your turn. All right, I'm gonna cast Sacred Bolt at it again. That's a 21 to hit for 17 radiant damage. Nice! A ray of piercing white light shoots out, impaling it in the stomach. It groans and lets out a roar, but is still holding tight to Varus. All right, that's it for me. I'll actually try something different. I'll use Tasha's Mind Whip. It needs to make an intelligence saving throw. That's a 21. Damn, all right, it still takes half damage. That's only six psychic damage, though. All right, anything else, or is it my turn again? Yeah, that's it for me. All right, it is going to make another attack roll against Varus. That's a 28 to hit. You actually aren't going to take any damage, though, as the demon throws you into the portal to the abyss. You tumble out the other side, crashing down a mountain and into another Glabrezu that was about to make it through the portal. There is an acrid, poisonous smell to the air in the abyss, and as you look around, the landscape is writhing, almost alive. Hell no! I gotta get back through that portal then! That might be difficult. As you look around, you see probably a dozen or so of the Glabrezu on this side of the portal. Anyways, we will get to that in a moment. Back in the material plane, the Glabrezu is going to attack Brom next. That's a 15, which misses. Then he'll attack again. That's a 25, which does hit. That deals 13 damage, and you are grappled as well as he closes a hand around your throat. He's going to march back over to the portal, ready to throw you in as well. But that'll have to wait until next turn. He can only do that once per turn, but he will squeeze your throat, dealing another. 14 points of damage. You'll need to make a constitution saving throw as well. Wow, I think we lose this, guys. That's a 10. You are barely able to hang on to consciousness. All right, Varus, your turn. Could I make it back to the portal? You could try, but there are a dozen hungry Glabrizu that are looking at you as if you are their next dinner and are also moving towards the portal to the material plane. Those idiotic cultists. All right, well, I'm going out swinging. I want to run up and attack the Glabrizu that is the nearest to entering the portal. Okay, you can make it up to him. Still probably another 60 or so feet from the portal. Well, I'll reckless attack and then use my great weapon thing again. That's a 19 to hit, dealing 17 damage. Then I'll swing twice more, but without the minus five to my hit. That's a dirty 20 and a natural one, dealing a total of 15 damage. You swing at it several times, and on the last swing, it catches your great axe mid-swing, wrenching it from your grip. All right, Brom, your turn. I want to cast Guiding Bolt as my last third level spell. That's a 17 to hit exactly. That does hit, right? Yeah, that hits his armor class. That's 23 radiant damage then. The Glabrizu lets out a roar of pain as you fire a blinding bolt of celestial energy right into his face. He drops you, and you are barely able to catch onto the edge of the portal before falling into the abyss. All right, Barak, you gotta close this portal and get out of here. I'll drop into the abyss. What the hell, Joe? How am I supposed to close this thing? Brom, you find yourself crashing into the same Glabrizu as Varus as well, knocking it onto its back as it drops Varus's great axe. All right, Barak, it's your turn. All right, well, I guess since Brom isn't there anymore, I'll use Storm Sphere centering on the portal. It needs to make a strength saving throw. Also within the 20 foot sphere, it is difficult terrain. That's a 22 on my part. Really, that's all Barak? We just sacrificed ourselves so that you can close this thing. Then as my bonus action, I'm going to shoot it with lightning. That's a 19 dealing 15 damage. The cave becomes the center of a whirlwind and a bolt of lightning strikes the Glabrizu. It howls with pain, turning in the general direction of Barak, but blinded from the guiding bolt by Brom. It isn't quite able to make it out of the sphere. All right, it needs to make another strength saving throw. That's a 12. That's nine bludgeoning damage then. It shakes, falling to a knee. Back in the abyss, the horde of Glabrizu descend on Varus and Brom. They are able to hold their own until something new lumbers up the writhing landscape. A hulking behemoth, twin heads snapping violently. Your vision blurs and the ground seems to begin to swallow you up. Despite desperately and valiantly fighting back, Varus and Brom cannot stand in the way of the ruler of the abyss, Demo Gorgon itself. All right, your turn again, Barak. Holy hell, this is really bad, guys. Yeah, close the portal, Barak. I don't know how. All right, first I'll use my bonus action to hit it with lightning again. That's a 17 for 15 damage. Finally, I'll use my last third level fireball spell on the ceiling of the cavern hoping to collapse it and buy me some time to get back to the academy. Roll for damage. That's 29 damage. There is a massive explosion as the cave shakes, Barak. You tear for the exit, using your enhanced speed from Bladesong to make it just as the cave collapses behind you. The whirlwind stops, and you just see a pile of rubble where before there had been a cave. Damn, that was a close one, guys. I still don't quite know how this connects to the gold pseudo-dragon, though. That's what you say we literally just died. 
Well, I figure that I know that I am in my meditation, so I know that this happened a long time ago, and I've already processed my grief and disbelief. That's fair. What do you do now? I'm guessing back to the Academy. Yeah, Ben? Yeah. You hurry as fast as you can back to Neverwinter, hardly stopping from a breakneck sprint. You make it to the campus, running headfirst into Master Incantara, the headmaster of the Academy. Watch where you are going. Damn, people are walking here. I have half a mind to kick you out of the school on the spot. He then notices your state of disarray, sweat coating your brow and blood from your wounds. What happened? Where have you come from? Neverwinter Woods, sir. We were sent to investigate a cult that was kidnapping people and then they opened a portal to the Abyss. Oh, really, a portal to the Abyss? Tell me, what did this fictitious portal look like? And then you'll tell me what really happened and where you have come from. No, really, Headmaster. It was a bubbling pool of crimson, and then a creature emerged that was covered in spikes. It took Brahm and Varus with it back to the Abyss. He eyes you suspiciously. Roll for persuasion. Could I do Arcana instead? Sure, I'll allow that. Well, that could have been better. That's a 12. He frowns, a crease furrowed in his brow. If this is some kind of prank, I'm warning you, my patience has already worn thin. It's not a prank, I swear. Nodding slowly, he gestures. Come to my office. We can talk more there. He leads you into the administration building and up a spiral staircase to an office. There, on his desk, you recognize something. The exact same goblet as the one that Nugget had transformed into when he was demonstrating his skills. Damn, I knew I had seen it before then. I just couldn't remember. So Nugget used to belong to Master Incantara at the Academy? How did those halflings get a hold of it? All right, tell me everything about this portal. Who opened it? Had it been fully developed? Is it spreading now? I don't know. We arrived just as the cult was performing the final parts of the ceremony or whatever. Then the Crimson Pool appeared after he performed the sacrifice. Then the demon came out, we killed all of the cultists, and then it dragged both Varus and Brahm into the portal. I used all my magic that I could and conjured a storm inside the cave, and then blew up the roof with a fireball. You see a look of anger grow on his face. You threw a fireball and destroyed the cave? That is bad news indeed. Why is that bad news? I stopped them for a moment, but I need help to seal the portal. I think you have helped enough. You are what, a third year? You should have come straight back here and let someone know the moment you found the cult in the middle of such a rite. You got those other two students killed, you know that? You're an idiot and a fool. Leave. You are banished from the academy. Gather your things and get out of my sight. We have quite the mess to clean up because of you. Why are you banishing me? I've done nothing wrong. You're broken protocols and rules and gotten other students killed. You should be ashamed of who you are as a wizard. Wow, that seems harsh. You probably saved the world back there. Thanks, Joe. All right, well, I'll storm out and gather up my things. As you gather up your things and leave the academy grounds, you see a man walking towards you with a hood on. Hello there, Barak, wizard of the academy. I apologize for your situation. Rest assured, you did the right thing. Who are you? Someone with a job offer that I think you will be interested in. I have here a letter from King Rex. He rules over a small land not too far from here. He is organizing a team of bodyguards to protect an ambassador. Anyways, the letter explains it in further detail. I was sent to give it to a worthy wizard of the academy, and after hearing of your heroics, that was obviously you, despite what these children in ivory towers may believe. That doesn't really answer my question, though. Who are you? It is not important. He hands you the letter and begins walking away. If you are interested, the group shall meet in Fandelver in just a few weeks' time. You see a glimmer of gold in a pouch on his backpack, the same chalice as you had seen in the headmaster's office. Nugget. Damn, this is strange. Did I get a good look at him at all, Ben? You didn't. No, he had a cloth covering his face and he was wearing a hood. Well, I don't have anywhere else to go. My family would reject me now that I was banished from the Academy. I guess luck would have it that I went to Fandelver then. All right, that does wrap up our little flashback episode, though. So back in the present, the three of you are in Lug's cave, resting and taking turns watching the stone linked to Marcus's new eye. Barak, you emerge from your meditation in a sweat. You had not visited those memories since they had happened, and they still leave you a bit shook. All right, I'll relay everything about Nugget to both Joden and Donatello. So you're saying that a hooded man approached you out of the blue and hired you for this job? A hooded man did the same for me. He even helped me find out Amabo had cheated and was a worthless coward. That same thing happened to me too. I was walking through a small town and then he came out of nowhere with a job offer. I had nothing better to do, so I decided to go for it. Strange. Anyway, so I saw Nugget all the way back then. Master must have literally been Master Incantara. I have no idea how or why Nugget would have ended up in that halfling home. Obviously, there is something strange going on here. Yeah, and Nugget is at the center of all of it. We should kill him. I want to ask Nugget if he remembers being taken to the halfling home. He looks up with a rather proud expression on his face. Well, yes, of course. Traveler was very kind. Took Nugget away from Master. Master was evil. Demons all around. Damn it. 
So that was why I was banished then. I thought that was strange when it happened, but I was pretty angry and confused. Master Incantara must have been involved with the demon cult. That was why he was so angry after I told him I had destroyed them. Wait a minute, I thought that you graduated. Was that all a lie then? I should have graduated, I stopped a demon incursion for Christ's sakes. I completed all of my schooling and everything, and then the headmaster banished me for nothing. So yeah, technically it was a lie, but I pretty much graduated. But you didn't. That means you aren't even a real wizard then, right? I've been doing magic this whole time. Wizards don't have to go to school. Yeah, yeah. Just because you couldn't hack it at the academy doesn't mean you are a failure as a person. Just as a wizard. For Christ's sake, Donatello. You better shut your mouth, otherwise I'm going to come over there and shut it for you. Besides, I thought you said that you were the champion of the arena Donatello, and the greatest fighter in all of Trumpville. But you lost to Amabo the Dwarf, didn't you? All right, that's it. I'm pulling my sword and killing all three of you. Okay, guys, calm down. Let's get back to the campaign. I want to ask Nugget who this Traveler guy is. Traveler was a traveler and a watcher, always up to something he was, and always kind. Made sure I was safe in my new home. Took the other teapot so that Nugget wouldn't be noticed, then told Nugget to hide until Nugget was taken from the home. Nugget was supposed to reveal himself when the mists came. Nugget was too scared by the mists. God damn it, Ben. That means that someone has been setting this up the whole time. But why? Why would they make sure that we had a gold pseudo-dragon, and why would they choose us? I mean, obviously we are growing in power now, but at the time we were all pretty low-level nobodies. Speak for yourself. Yeah, something strange is going on here. Somehow somebody recruited us specifically and knew ahead of time that we were going to end up in the domains of dread. The obvious choice is Peter, but he said that when he left Darkon, he ended up just outside of Fandelver where we met him. Damn, that was so close to a nice job remembering all of that, Joe. I was about to be proud of you until you said that it was Peter. Obviously, they had to have been working with either Rex or whatever Dark Power sent Thorn to Loudwater, since he knew that we had been hired to help him at that point. Regardless, I don't see a whole lot that we can do about it. We are here now, and I think our best option is still to defeat the champions and help out Thorn. Maybe we could ask either him or the Doctor about who that Traveler would have been. Or Lug, he's an Oracle, right? Yeah, but he hasn't been very helpful as of yet. Except for telling us where Zephyr's family would be. That's kind of the only question we have asked him, though. Maybe we just need to ask about it and he could help us more. Whatever. If I know Ben, Lug is just going to give us some cryptic answer. Guess you'll just have to wait and see. All right, anything else you guys want to ask or talk about Nugget, or do you want to discuss what you saw in the Sight Stealer? Let's discuss the Sight Stealer. Are we able to make out where they are located? During your watches throughout the night, you saw them exit from a crypt in the very same graveyard where you had hidden outside of the church. There was a tunnel in the crypt that led into the basement, which is where you saw the meeting taking place. You did notice that it was a maze, but you should be able to track through it now that you have seen Marcus exit. Did we see any traps or guards? There's a pair of guards at the very end, just before the meeting room. You didn't see any traps along the path, at least along the right path. All right, any other information, or can we go ask Lug if he knows who the Traveler is and get over to the shipwreck? Ben, there better be treasure there, or I swear I'm taking over as Dungeon Master. I guess that's another thing we will have to wait to see. All right, in addition to all of that, you are also able to see Marcus's home, and he also paid a visit to a small prison where you saw a handful of people locked in small cages, very inhumanely. The prison was located just outside of the market district in a small abandoned house. All right, we should free them first thing then. Well, after we get the soul capturer from Zephyr. One final thing before we leave, we should try sending another message to Silas. Joden, I think you haven't sent one yet, yeah? All right, yeah, I can send it this time. Let's see here. Silas, it's us again. Hope you're doing well or are back in the marsh of Chelumber. Meet us in Mantira Bay. You once again can feel someone on the other side, but then the connection closes forcefully, and you can feel that the other stone has been destroyed. Damn, I bet Silas is in some deep shit if he is here. Otherwise, I think he would try to talk to us. I guess that's another thing to talk to Lug about. Hopefully he has some answers. You exit the small tunnel where you stayed the night, and find Lug still sitting on his throne, stroking his massive chin as though he is deep in thought. He does look up as you enter, though. Greetings. I hope the accommodation suited you well enough. Yeah, yeah, it was great. Now, Lug, you need to give us some answers. First things first, do you know who recruited us for this quest? Like, it seems that some stranger specifically sought out the three of us and hired us to accompany Thorn. But according to him, he wouldn't have been in the Sword Coast at the time. That was before I had the sight. I do not possess knowledge of things that I could not have known. But there are machinations in play, with the three of you at the center of them. I do not know what chose you, but something or someone did. And I do believe it was for nefarious purposes. 
You have avoided fate before, though, and I trust that you could do it again. All right, well, that's good to know, I suppose. So something is pulling strings, and pretty crazy strings, too, since there was only a small chance that we would end up taking the teapot from the halfling home. Lug, would this sight stealer help to restore your sight? We feel kind of bad about that. He lets out a deep laugh, booming and shaking the cavern walls. Yes, that would restore my physical sight. And if it so be that you choose to give it to me willingly, I would be grateful. But I am more than capable without my sight as well. Yeah, we give it to you willingly. Finally, do you know what happened to Silas? Did he come with us to darken? Is he okay? You see a dark blue light emanating from within Lug's empty eye sockets, which slowly fades. Yes, I had tracked the vampire here to darken, but where he is now is warded from my sight. That is not a good sign. He may be a champion already. A champion for vampire? Could that really happen so fast? If one gives themselves willingly to a dark power, it can be almost instant. I believe that you will feel of their power soon enough. I am sure that each of you has attracted one of their foul gazes. There is power in serving them, to be sure. But you must be aware that there is a cost as well. That's the second time you mentioned them. Are you saying that the dark powers are seeking to make us champions as well? I suppose that is one way of looking at it. Though I believe for now they would just be curious. You do possess more power than the average Darken resident, and have performed some mighty feats. Interesting. Well, I'm turning them down if I have a choice in the matter. No way am I going to serve a dark power. And if your friends' lives depend on it? Well... I'll keep an open mind, but they'd need to tell me the cost before I accept any help from them. I'll give Lug the sight stealer and the stone associated with it, just to make sure that he doesn't think we are just trying to spy on him. All right. Reluctantly. Should we head to the shipwreck then? Hell yeah, I'm ready to go treasure hunting for once. Lug places the sight stealer in his left eye, letting out a groan of pain before he opens his eye, the sight stealer shining brightly. Thank you, adventurers. I do appreciate this gift, though I hope you know that it means nothing in the long run. I am still merely a watcher, and though I hope you are able to heal the land, I will not be of assistance in your quest. You exit the cavern, and you hear the booming words of Lug echoing behind you. Do not forget my orb. I have traveled far for it, and can reward you with more knowledge for its retrieval. I had honestly kind of forgotten he wanted us to get an orb from Baron Midas. Did he give us the warding stones too? Ha! Guess who forgot it this time? Wasn't me. I know for a fact that he gave us the stones, and I had not forgotten about the orb for a second. Is that true, Joden? Yes, absolutely. Liar, liar, pants on fire. Anyways, what's the shipwreck like, Ben? As you exit and your eyes adjust to the blinding light, you can see the shipwreck more clearly now that it is early morning. The salty spray of the ocean pokes holes in the thick mists of Ravenloft, giving the ship an almost ethereal look. As you approach closer, wading through the water, you see a hole in the hull that would allow you to enter through the bowels of the ship. It is heavily waterlogged, so it would be covered at high tide. In we go, then. The room you enter into looks to be an old storage room. As your eyes adjust to the dim light, you see a bunch of storage crates and old supplies strewn across the floor. The rancid smell of rotting fruit is quite potent. Maneuvering through the boxes, you see a door leading further into the ship. Anything of value or mostly just the supplies for the crew as they traveled? Anything of use would have rotted or rusted away by now. It looks like this ship has been here for quite a while. All right, I'll go through the door then. Hell no, I'm going first, and I get first pick of any treasure that we find. All right, whatever, Donatello, you go first then. As you begin to push open the door, you can hear faint whispering coming from within the ship, and then a gust of air blows salt into your eyes. Wiping the salt away and squinting through watery eyes, you see a translucent figure glowing with a low green light staring down at a skeleton on the floor. The room appears to be a kitchen of sorts. You see a couple of cupboards with the doors having rotted off, and a table is in the middle of the room, held up by a solitary leg that looks like it would give out at any moment. All right, haunted shipwreck it is then. Let's kill him then. Hold up, Donatello. Does he seem hostile, Ben? On the contrary, he hardly seems to acknowledge that you are here at all, just staring down at the skeleton on the floor. As you get a closer look, you see a knife jabbed in the back of the skeleton and having rusted away. It looks like someone had stabbed him in the back. You hear him muttering, he was my friend. He was part of the crew. Why would he do this? Damn, I feel bad for this guy. Well, let's put him to rest then, yeah? Yeah, might as well, I guess. How though, just kill him? That might upset any other ghosts that are on board. Ben, do I know any spells or rituals that I can use to help him pass to the other side? I'm going to go with no. Since none of you are clerics or paladins, you aren't familiar with that type of magic, though you do know that it exists for sure. Let's just leave him alone then, he isn't harming us. Yeah, that won't come back to bite us in the ass. I'm a bit torn here, not sure what we should do. I'm gonna stab him with my sword. As you stab your sword through his back the same way he died in life, his ghost gasps and falls to his knees before fading into the ether. Damn it, Donatello. You'll thank me later. Why'd you have to stab him in the back though? 
Damn, he died twice by being stabbed in the back. Yeah, that seemed cruel. All right, let's move on then. Anything else in this room, Ben? Nothing in this one, but you do see another door. This one leading to a rotted staircase leading up to the next level. Probably a lot more ghosts up here. I wonder if this is what Lug was talking about when he said there are fates worse than death in Ravenloft. Being a ghost on a shipwreck for the rest of eternity sounds pretty bad. That and the fact that everyone here is a zombie means that just dying might not be the end. Especially if necromancers are so popular here. All right, what's up the staircase, Ben? Well, two things before you enter the next room. First, what's your marching order? I'm in the lead, obviously. I'll be behind him then. Guess I'm taking up the rear. All right, second, I'll need all of you to make dexterity saving throws. Hell yeah, even with my minus one to dexterity, that's still a 16. You're kidding me. I have a plus six to my saving throws for dexterity, and that's a nine for me. Damn, sorry, Joe. That's an 18 for me. All right, Donatello. As you slowly creep up the stairs, Joden takes a slightly different path, and one of the steps caves in, sending Joden tumbling down with a splash. Joden, you are now in a different room of the ship that is beneath the sea level, and it's a good 20-foot fall from the steps up above. You do take eight damage from the broken wood in the fall. Damn. All right, well, I guess I have to save the day again. I do have some rope. Let me pull you up, Joden. Wait, we should make sure that we have a good spot to pull him up. If the stairs are already unstable and we add Joden to those stairs, good chance we end up falling in too. Damn, you're right, Barack. All right, whatever. Ben, is there anything that I could tie the rope to and then being pulling him up? But this way we have an anchor. As you reach the top of the stairs looking for something to tie the rope to, you hear the clashing of metal. And as you open the door, you see a crowd of ghostly sailors engaged in an eternal fight, slashing each other with spectral swords and then getting back up after they would have died. Three of the ghosts look over at you and then begin to charge. Back in the submerged room, Joden, you feel a hand grab your leg and begin pulling you down, and you see a sailor, flesh rotting off his face, pulling you down to the floor with a hungry look in his eyes. Looking around, you see probably 15 or so of the drowned zombies, all slowly moving through the water towards you. Damn, really trying to turn up the difficulty. This is like that scene in Harry Potter. Only if you cast a fireball from up there. All right, let's roll for initiative then. Joden, just as a couple of additional rules since you'll be fighting in the water, your bow has disadvantage, but your short swords are fine, and you have resistance to fire damage. In addition, if you are underwater and take a hit, you'll have to make a constitution saving throw to avoid inhaling a bunch of salt water. That's a bit of homebrew, but I think it makes sense. Damn, all right, let's do this. We'll be down to help you in just a moment, Joden, just don't die. That's a 21 for initiative for me. God damn it, I'm rolling terrible here, guys. I probably will need help. That's a 10 for me. That's an unnatural 20 for me. I got a 17, so it'll go Donatello, Barack, me, and then Joden. All right, Donatello, you're up first. Time to kill some ghosts. All right, I'll just be swinging with my long sword. That's a 25 and then a 12 to hit. What do we need to get? You need a 13, so that's just the one hit then. Damn it. That's only eight damage. That was stupid. I don't want to action surge yet either. Better to save that for whatever stupid dungeon boss Ben has worked up. All right, my turn then. I'm going to enter Bladesong using my bonus action and then cast Scorching Ray as a third level spell. I don't think Fireball would be a good choice here. Sure, it'd just blow up the ship. That's a nine, a 13, a 16, and a 19 to hit. So three of those hit for 11, four, and seven damage. How much health do these ghosts have? You are able to kill one of the ghosts with that damage plus Donatello's. All right, it's the zombies and the ghosts' turns now. The two remaining ghosts are going to all attack Donatello since he is in the lead. That's a 14 and a 22, so one of those does hit for 14 necrotic damage. You'll need to make a constitution saving throw too, Donatello. Not this shit again. Is it the same thing the Wraith did to me that almost killed me, allegedly at least? Yeah. Hell yeah, that's a 25 for me. All right, it's just the 14 damage then. Then the zombies are going to begin pulling Joden underwater. Joden, you'll need to make an athletics check, but I'll let you use dexterity instead of strength. Thank goodness, that's a 19. All right, you do resist the pull underwater, but you feel the zombies scratching at your legs as you kick them away. You take another 14 points of slashing damage. Damn, these guys hit hard. Well, there's 15 zombies down there. That's not very much damage across that many zombies. I guess that's fair. All right, Joden's turn then. Ben, am I faster than the zombies? You most certainly are, especially if you use your action to try to get further away. What about a door? Are there any doors or anything down here? There is a door, but it is underwater and on the other side of the room. You'd need to succeed on a strength check to push it open, and you don't quite know what is on the other side. Since the whole door is submerged, though, 
it wouldn't be a hard check or anything. Just have to push open a rotted and old door underwater. Well, that's where I'm heading, I guess. I can't just sit here until you guys finish up with the ghosts up above. All right, make a strength check. God damn it, I'm rolling completely garbage all of a sudden. That's a seven. All right, you aren't able to quite open the door before going back up for some air and to get out of the zombies' reach. Donatello, you're up next. Time to kill these ghosts for real this time. Damn, none of us are rolling good. You guys probably cursed me or something. That's a 17 and an 11, so only one of those hit for a total of 13 damage. All right, that ghost is still looming menacingly and does look injured from your hit. Anything else? Nah, still saving my action surge. At this rate, we might need to take a short rest, though. You and Joden both took a hit. Mostly Joden over there. I'm still doing fine. Whatever. All right, I'm going to slash with my scimitar at the ghost Donatello just hit and then firebolt it after that since I'm in Blade Song. Sounds good. Only a 12 to hit with the scimitar, but then a 24 with the firebolt for a total of 20 damage. Nice. All right. Your scimitar barely misses probably due to you being a bit out of practice with a sword, but as you unleash the firebolt, it leaves behind just a small puddle of ectoplasm on the floor. Anything else for your turn? No, that's it for me. All right, the last remaining ghost, or rather the last ghost focused on the two of you, is going to attack Donatello again. That's only a 10 to hit, so it misses. All right, now, Joden, you'll need to make another dexterity saving throw to try to stay above the zombies. Hell yes, finally it's about time. That's a natural 20. All right. I'll say that you are actually able to just stay completely above the reaching zombie hands and take zero damage this round. You are also able to lead the zombies away from the door, giving you another chance to try to open it without risking an attack from the underwater zombies. It's your turn now, too. I'm going for the door then. All right, things are looking up. That's a 21. You're able to push through the door and push it closed behind you, though you aren't quite sure how long it will hold against the zombies. The room is completely submerged, but also zombie free. You see some more of the crates, and out of the corner of your eye, and thanks to your dark vision, you see a small, watertight jewelry box. You also see a hole in the wall that would lead you into the ocean, just below where the entrance was that the party entered up above. I'm grabbing the jewelry box and then getting out of here then. I'll make my way through the ship and go meet up with them. All right, you are able to do both of those things, but we'll have to finish combat to see when you meet up with them. Donatello, it's your turn next. I swear, if I get below a 13 on either of these rolls, I'm gonna lose it for real this time. All right, this is more like it. That's a 19 on the die, which is a critical hit, and a 25, that's a total of 26 damage. With a quick slash back and forth, you reduce the last ghost to a steaming pile of ectoplasm as well, which drips through the floorboards into the room Joden had fallen into. Looking back, you see Joden, completely soaked from his trip in the ocean, climbing up the stairs. Glad you made it back, Joden. Yeah, yeah, enough chit chat. What's in the jewelry box? I think we should deal with the rest of the ghosts and this whole haunted ship thing first, right? Then we can take a look. Yeah, that makes sense. All right, do any of the other ghosts attack us, Ben? None of the other ones pay you any attention, too focused on their raging battle. The water damage does appear to be less up here, though there are many holes in the floor where the zombies had fallen down below. You find another staircase leading up another floor, presumably onto the deck, judging by the rays of light streaming through. Upwards we go then. Not completely sure where we need to go, though. Obviously, up Barack, God, have you never played a video game? It's a rather straightforward dungeon here. Christ, Donald, I meant what our purpose is here. Unless it really is just treasure. I'd love to learn more about what happened to make this ship crash and end up here, and free those ghosts down below if we can. Yeah, I agree on both counts, though treasure isn't bad either. All right, as you come up on the deck, the sun is shining faintly through the thick mists rolling in from the ocean. A bird circles the crow's nest up above, and the top of the deck is a mess. You can see on the far side of the ship, the captain's quarters, a luminescent green glow emanating from under the door. As you swing the door open, you see that the inside has been remarkably well-preserved or is under some kind of illusion spell. Before you can really examine anything though, you see a spectral green figure rushing at you and just behind it, a lumbering zombie. Both of them are wearing a captain's hat and both look like they are out for blood. Traitors, traitors, the whole lot of you. I'll kill you, I'll kill all of you. A brief lag happens between the voice of the ghost and the voice of the zombie lumbering behind it. Interesting. A pirate captain ghost and a pirate captain zombie. Something strange is going on here for sure. All right, here we go, boss battle time. Yeah, let's roll for initiative. That's a 23 for me. A 13 for me. A 13 for me as well. You can go first though, Barack. Thanks, Joden. I only got a six, so you guys will go before the captain. Or captains, I guess. And I'm going first. All right, I'm going to attack the ghost one, and I'm going to use my action surge to attack twice. What do I need to hit? 
The ghost has a 16 armor class and the zombie has an 18 armor class. Damn, upping the difficulty I see. All right, I got this though. That's a 23, a 15, a 24, and a 19 on the dice for a critical hit. That's a total of 43 damage. Nice hit, Donatello. Thanks, I know, I'm pretty awesome. The captain hardly flinches as he swings out with his glowing green cutlass. Damn, only a 13 to hit though. I rolled pretty bad. Wait, why did he get to attack? He has legendary actions. Both of them do, actually. The other zombie is going to lunge forward as well, moving with superhuman speed to stand in front of both Jodan and Barak. Well, I guess we are going to have to deal with this zombie then, while you deal with the ghost Donatello. No worries, I got this here, guys. I'll help you out once I finish this guy off. I'll go ahead and enter Bladesong with my bonus action, and then I guess I'll use my fourth level slot to cast Storm Sphere. Any chance I can hit both of them with that, Ben? It's a 40-foot sphere. You could, but then you'd also hit Donatello as well. Damn. Just hit me with it, I'll be fine. All right, just with the first part of the spell. You should move out of the sphere on your turn. All right, so the two captains and Donatello need to make a strength saving throw. Hell yeah, I got this for sure. That's a 25 for me, I'm on fire here, guys. I got a 19 on the ghost and an 11 on the zombie, so he will use his legendary resistance to succeed on that though. Damn, all right. I need to wait until my next turn to cast a lightning bolt as my bonus action, so Joden, you're up. All right, well, I think I need to attack with my short swords, which aren't great, but otherwise he'd get an opportunity attack and might wreck Barack. What the hell? All right, you guys aren't going to believe this, but I just rolled three 19s in a row. I don't have Donatello's improved critical, but those all hit, right, Ben? Yeah, those all hit. Sweet, so that's a total of... Damn, 14 damage. I really need some better short swords, guys. You just need to use your bow. All right, also at the end of Joden's turn, the ghost is going to attack Donatello again. That's nine slashing damage and 11 necrotic damage. You don't need to roll this time though, Donatello. He doesn't reduce your hit points. Holy hell. That wasn't even for his turn, right? That was just a legendary action? Yeah, now it is their turns. The ghost is going to attack Donatello twice. Damn, that's an 11 and a 10. One of those was a nat one and the other was a two. All right, the zombie is going to attack once at Joden and once at Barak. That's a 17 to hit Joden and a 27 to hit Barak. Joden, you take 11 slashing damage and 14 poison damage, and Barak, you take 16 slashing damage and eight poison. Barak, that also means you need to roll for your concentration. The save DC is 12. That was close, I can't take another hit like that, guys. I got a 15 on the save DC. They need to remake the strength saving throws or they take damage though, since they ended their turn in the sphere. Oh yeah, that's right. That's a fail on both of their parts, but they will use their remaining two legendary resistances to succeed instead. I really hate that feat. Yeah, it is pretty annoying. They don't have any more until tomorrow, though. Well, back to Donatello, then. Why the hell didn't Lug warn us about this? There's a good chance we die here, guys. I told you all we shouldn't have come here. Whatever. All right, I'm attacking the ghost again. That's a 16 and a 25 for a total of 24 damage. Then I'll also use second wind to recover. 15 hit points. I'll also move outside of the storm sphere, but stay within range of the ghost so he doesn't get an opportunity attack. That's my turn. All right, starting off on my turn, I'm going to throw the lightning bolt at this zombie. I have advantage since he is in the sphere too. That's a 19 for... Damn, only 9 damage. That was 4d6 and I only got a 9. That was dumb. All right, for my action, I'm actually going to disengage and I'm going to use my extra movement speed to cross the deck as far as I can. All right, anything else for your turn, Barack? Sadly, no, that's it for me. I think you're right, Donatello. I need to use my bow, but if I move... Then he gets an opportunity attack against me. Guess it's worth it though. All right, Ben, I'm gonna move and provoke an opportunity attack. I do get to move 35 feet because of my new armor though. That's a 21 to hit, dealing 12 slashing damage and 13 poison damage. Damn, I'm dead then, guys. For reals, Joden, you're so weak. It wasn't my fault I was listening to you. Besides, I think you're the only one who's been down so far this whole campaign. All right, you aren't dead though, just knocked unconscious. You'll have to make death saving throws to see what happens. Those will be kept private as well, so nobody will know if you are dying or not. All right, damn, is it their turn then? It is, yeah. So the zombie is going to have to dash to get over to Barack. He can't attack, but he is now face to face with you. Then the ghost is going to attack Donatello twice. Damn, you must have something watching over you because I can't hit you at all, Donatello, even with a plus nine to the hit. That's a 10 and a 14. All right, the ghost is going to make a strength saving throw again since he is still in the sphere. That's a 13, so he does fail and has no more legendary resistances. Damn, only five damage though. 
All right, that was pretty lucky for us. I guess I could just keep running away from this zombie. It takes his whole turn to catch up to me. Yeah, until he gets his legendary actions back. Then you're dead too. All right, my turn then? Yeah. I'm attacking the ghost, of course. That's a 13 and a 16, so only one of those hit for a total of 11 damage. All right, the ghost is looking wounded now. Now he's looking wounded? For Christ's sake, Ben, you can't just kill off all of us in one go. You guys chose to come to a dangerous shipwreck. Of course we did. You basically shouted that there was loot here. I guess that's fair. All right, anything else for your turn, Donatello? No, that's it for me. All right, I'm going to lightning bolt this guy in the face. He got a 22 on the save, so he'll take half damage. Damn. All right. That's 32 total, so 16 lightning damage then. I'm also going to use my bonus action to throw a lightning bolt from the storm sphere at the ghost. I'm probably dead here, but I think our best bet is to kill the ghost and then focus the zombie. God damn it, only a 13 to hit, so that's a miss. All right, Joden, it is your turn now. Before you roll your death saving throw, though, you do hear something in your unconscious mind. I can save you and your friends if you want me to. Just say yes and I can do it, a man says. The voice sounds incredibly familiar, but you can't quite place it. Damn, of course I'm the one who gets first contact with the dark powers. You better say yes. It pains me to say this, but we need your help. Yeah, I think you have to do it, Joden. Otherwise, we might all die here. Yeah, fine, I get it. Lug is an oracle and saw this coming from a mile away. All right, yes, I need your help. You feel a surge of power coursing in your veins. All right, here is your new temporary character sheet. Holy hell, I'm a level 20. For now, at least. I'm about to wreck these guys. All right, I'm going to attack the zombie first, since I think there is a chance I can just kill him. How do I activate my bow thing again? First off, I'd just like to say that this isn't fair that Joden is a level 20 now. This is all rigged, but you just have to say Thorn. It's that easy. Oh yeah, I remember that now. All right, I'll say Thorn, and then I want to shoot at the zombie. How far away are the zombie and the ghost? They are further than 10 feet, so you can't do your volley or horde breaker, unfortunately. Also, as you say, Thorn, your bow grows nasty thorns and becomes larger, taking more strength to pull back the string. You'll deal 2d6 on the attack instead of 1d6, and you'll roll 3d6 for your extra damage. That's awesome. All right, I'll shoot at the zombie twice then. That's a 23 and a 29. That's 50 total damage against the zombie. Damn, even with all of that, my damage didn't go up nearly as high as I thought it would. Yeah, you would probably have a lot stronger of a weapon if you were level 20, and you could attack any number of creatures with your volley attack. Just against one enemy, you aren't dealing as much damage. That's fair, and it was a lot of damage. Not that much. Can you imagine how much damage I would have dealt if that was me? Probably over 100. Whatever, shut up, Donatello. How's the zombie doing then, Ben? The zombie falls forward, and you see two arrow shafts in the back of its skull, Barak. All right, I believe it is the ghost's turn now, yeah? Yeah, that's it for me. All right, the ghost is going to turn. A look of rage as it stares down Joden for killing, well, him. He's going to rush over to Joden, meaning you'll get an opportunity to attack Donatello. Hell yeah, this thing is dead. Damn it, that's a 13. He's then going to rush over to Joden and slash at him twice. That's a 27 and then a 27 again, which even gets through your multi-attack defense, Joden, for a total of 46 damage. No sweat, I have over 200 health now. That is kind of frightening though. He still did a quarter of your health and we are fighting him at level seven. Whatever, I bet I'll have like 400 health. Stop being jealous, Donatello, it's not a good look. I am not jealous, it's just rigged, that's all. Have to call out injustice when I see it. Sorry that I died listening to you and then became super powerful by accepting help from a dark power without knowing the cost, Donatello. Christ, you're just a big baby. All right, calm down. Donatello, it's your turn now. Time to kill this thing. That's a nine and a 26 for a total of 14 damage. That better have killed him, Ben. Otherwise, we are going to have a problem. That does kill him, Donatello, don't worry. He explodes, thick ectoplasm splattering across the deck of the ship. Joden. You feel the power beginning to fade, though your wounds heal up without so much as leaving a scar behind. It was fun while it lasted. You hear that voice again? Hauntingly familiar, but you can't quite place it. You are welcome, Joden the Ranger. I believe we shall meet again sometime. That's not foreboding at all. You also feel a strange tingling sensation in your arms, as though they were falling asleep. As you look, you can see them turning pale, the veins becoming increasingly dark and prominent. You'll gain resistance to necrotic damage but you'll be vulnerable to radiant damage unless you find a way to remove the dark gift. Interesting. All right, well, that was a lower cost than I thought it would be. That's not even that bad. Could be helpful to have in Darken. Not elsewhere, though. We should see what we can find out about that. All right, is there anything in the captain's quarters, Ben? 
As you enter the captain's quarters, you see a black obsidian medallion hovering above the captain's desk. You also see another ghost, this one sitting cross-legged on the ground inside of a magical binding circle. He looks up, a sorrowful expression on his face melting as he recognizes that you are not the captain. Is he, is he gone? Is the sea wolf finally dead? Yeah, we just killed him. Who are you? Gabriel Flint is, was my name, though most called me Red Tide. I was the first mate aboard the Sea Seraph here until the crew grew restless about the cruelties of Captain Blackwater, the Sea Wolf. We staged a mutiny and I made it all the way here fighting the Sea Wolf himself. Anyways, it did not go well. The Dark Star Medallion, he gestures at the floating necklace. It cursed us, trapped us here, doomed to forever be in a fight to the death with our fellow shipmates. After we died, the captain threw my body overboard and trapped me in this circle. I've been trapped here for, God, who knows how long it's been. Damn, that sucks, man. Who were you guys, pirates? Shadow shippers. We shipped goods across the domains of dread. It was an honest enough living, except we'd get the goods to sell through raiding other ships. The Sea Wolf wouldn't take hostages either. All of our ledgers are gushing blood, that's for sure. We probably deserve this fate. I don't think so. Do you know how we could free you? He looks up, a look of surprise registering on his ghostly face. If you could destroy the Dark Star, it would probably free us. How would we destroy it? He looks over at Barak. You're a wizard, right? I'll nod, yes, yeah, studied at the academy. Yes, yeah, studied, didn't graduate though. Could you cast a fireball? That would probably do the trick. All right, say we were gonna do that, what's in it for us? He points over at the far wall. That's a false wall. Behind it is the treasure chest. There's probably 1,000 or so shadow shards in it. I hope those are still used as currency here, yeah? All right, I'm sold. Let's get the loot and get out of here. Yeah, that's a good chunk of money. Probably not worth selling my soul to whatever dark power that was, but it lessens the pain for sure. It doesn't seem like you've sold your soul quite yet either. Just started that process, I guess. Fair. All right, let's get the money then. We'll destroy the Dark Star too. Or we take the Dark Star and sell it at the black market. Probably a lot of people willing to pay a lot of money for it. That's low Donatello. I know. Obviously, we have to destroy it. Just pointing out that we could make a lot of money. As you push back the false wall, you find the chest and 999 shadow shards. There's also an engraved short sword a blue streak running down the middle of it and emitting a faint blue light. Hell yeah, my new sword. Hold up, why does he get a magic sword? It's just one magic sword, Donatello. You already have one. Do I know what it does, Ben? It'll function as a plus one magic short sword, but that should increase your damage output in close quarters by a good amount. Are you guys blowing up the Dark Star then? Yeah, let's do that. Casting a fireball, you see the medallion begin to glow red hot before breaking in two as the entire cabin explodes. The waterlogged ship doesn't catch fire, but the structural integrity was definitely damaged. Gabriel begins to vanish. Thank you, we are in your debt. The ship is yours, if you could fix it up. No finer vessel has ever sailed these oceans. He fades from view, and you can hear the clamor down below fade as well, leaving you with just the sound of the ocean waves crashing against the hull. Hold up, can we become pirates then, Ben? It would take quite a bit of time and a fair amount of money to fix up the ship, especially with that fireball, but definitely cheaper than buying your own. It would be a good ocean vessel too, and can apparently sail across the domains too. That's pretty cool. All right, well, back to Lug then. Yeah, there's nothing more on the ship for you guys to see. As you descend back into the ship to exit, made a bit more difficult with the rising tide, you can see that the ghosts have all faded and the zombies down below have been put to rest. The sun has risen far in the sky, making it just in the early afternoon when you approach Lug's cave again. As you enter, once again, you feel that deep throaty laugh that shakes the whole cavern. I must admit that was entertaining. I have not seen such fighting in a long time. You were watching us? Why didn't you help? We could have used a giant oracle against that stupid captain. Perhaps, but I said before I am just a watcher. I do not intervene in the petty triflings of mortals. I did not sense you in real danger, though. He points a large finger at Joden. I must admit, I did not foresee your gift coming so quickly. The three of you must have really attracted the attention of some powerful entities. I suspect now that one has made contact, the other two of you will receive your own visitation shortly. So, out of game moment for just a second, but does this mean that we can't actually die? Like I died, but then a dark power just leveled me up to 20 and healed me back to full. That's actually a fair point. I don't want to give anything away, but you guys can definitely still die. Let's just say that that type of boon is very rare and difficult to pull off, even for a dark power. There has to be the right collection of variables. It might be able to stabilize you, might even be able to heal you back up, but that type of power is definitely a rarity. So you're saying that I might not get to try out my level 20 fighter? Not for a while in the campaign. Still a long ways to go before any of you hit level 20 for real. All right, let's get back to it then. Lug looks over at both Barack and Donatello. I can see that you both have sustained heavy wounds. Feel free to rest this afternoon. 
but I would suggest traveling through the night to get back to Mantira Bay. I have seen a lot of the trials awaiting you, and though I won't interfere, I would prefer if you succeed and bring me back the orb. Are we going to get ambushed or something? I thought that the warding stones would protect us from that. They will, I can assure you, even if you travel at night. Now that the Guardian of the Forest has been removed, you'll arrive safely in Mantira Bay. But I would warn you that things will not be easy when you get there. You should seek out the Resistance. They can help you gain a foothold with which to challenge the Baron. How would we find them? Thorne said that he doubted that there was ever more than a handful of people resisting the Night Watchers at any given point in time. You see the light within Lug's eyes again, growing in power and then fading away. Head for the Burgomaster of the town. He is corrupt, but has his hands in many different pockets. With enough, Motivation. He will put you in touch with the Resistance. Interesting, I'm still confused as to what you get out of this Lug. For now, let us just say that our motives and goals are aligned. There may come a time in the future when we must battle, and do not mistake me, if it comes to blows, I will not hold back. But I do not wish that future to come, nor do I think it has to. Despite our history, I must say that I am quite intrigued by the three of you. You've come a long ways from who you were when you stabbed out my eyes all those years ago. We haven't come that far, that was only like a week ago. A very long week then. Now the three of you should rest. And I believe that you still have the jewelry box obtained from the depths, Sir Joden of the Forest. I would recommend that you use what is contained therein. I believe that there is an item of interest to each of you inside. Also, we should discuss Nugget again. I have warmed up to the idea of keeping him around a little bit, but I think we should discuss how he can help us more. That's a good idea. All right, Ben, what's in the box? As you open the box, you see three rings, each gently laid on a velvet pillow. One of them has engravings of the elements, another has engravings of shadows, and the final one has engravings of battle and healing. Well, I think that's rather obvious what we should do then. I'll take the battle and healing one, Joden can have the shadows, and Barak can have the elements. Do we know what they do yet? After spending the long rest attuning to them, you do find what they can do. Joden, your ring of shadows allows you to blend into your environment as the shadows accept you as one of their own. You can use it three times per day to take the hide action as a bonus action, which allows you to move around unseen. Barak, your ring of the elements requires daily attunement to an element of your choice. And whenever you use something that deals damage of that element, you can add one D6 to the damage. And finally, Donatello, your ring of the warrior allows you to, once per day, regain health equal to the damage on a single attack. Damn, that's pretty nice on all counts. That'll help Joden get set up in a good spot with his bow, help Donatello with some sustain, and help me deal some more damage if I plan ahead what spells to use. Nice work, Ben. Thanks. I definitely wanted to have some unique items for each of you. All right, finally, you wanted to talk more about Nugget? Yeah. I don't really see how he can help us unless we are planning on setting him up somewhere to spy on someone. So I was thinking, what if we send him to infiltrate and spy on the Night Watchers? He can let us know if they are planning anything and then can come get us if things are going south. I don't quite know how he would infiltrate them, though. So, I don't think we had discussed who was holding Nugget after you found him in Donatello's bag. Who took him? Does Donatello still have him? Hell no. He isn't stealing all the rest of my stuff. I'll take him then. All right, he pops his head out of Barak's bag. Nugget very good at sneaking. Nugget turns invisible and hides very well in plain sight. With that, he does indeed turn invisible. All right, yeah. Once we get back to Mantira Bay, we should have him infiltrate the Night Watchers then. I'm surprised you trust him with that Donatello. Well, worst comes to worst, he just betrays us and we kill the Night Watchers that way. Nugget would never betray. You promised Nugget more gold. Nugget loves gold. Yeah, whatever. All right, well, should we head back to Mantira Bay then? Anything else that we need to do down here? Actually, I thought we would go ahead and end the session here. Kind of. I feel like things have been getting a little tense, so I thought we could finish off the session with a bit of PvP, finally settle that question of who would win in a fight. Oh, hell yeah, you better not be shitting me, Ben. I mean, that was assuming that you guys would want to do that. We could just end the session or keep going a little bit longer. I think I'll sit out for this fight, but that sounds fun. I could use a nap, and honestly, I'd rather watch the two of them fight than join myself. Okay, that seems fair. A bit easier to manage, too, since that means that two people won't just gang up on the third. All right, so it is Donatello versus Barack, the fighter from Trumpville against the wizard from Neverwinter. I'm going to win this so easy, just like I beat Hillary in the election. Are you sure you won't lose like you did against Joe? It was rigged, just like my dice are whenever I roll bad. It is settled. But let's make this fun. It's just supposed to get out some tension and settle the constant bickering. You guys will battle in a very light forest, 105th by 105th, and start on opposite corners. So you won't know where the other person is. Trees will be consistent, but be far enough apart so there will be enough open areas. Is that okay with you guys? I don't know. I'm a fighter. Starting that far apart will put me at a disadvantage. 
But if you're in a closed arena, Barack would be at a disadvantage. This way, both of you will have to find the other person. If you find him first, Donald, you could still easily get the upper hand. Fine, doesn't matter. I'm the best fighter in all of Trumpville. I will probably just one shot Barack. Barack, are you okay with the arena choice? Yeah, that's fine with me. Great. All right, the sun is just setting over the distant horizon in this alternate universe, as you have found yourselves transported to the domain of Valrock, the Warbringer. Valrock hosts these arenas, snatching people from across the forgotten realms in a fight to the death. You guys know the other is in the forest, but you don't know where. The forest isn't too dense. You can still see pretty far before your vision is blocked by the trees, and there is an open plain in the middle, probably about 50 feet across in all directions. Let's roll for initiative. I rolled a 12, but my plus six gives me an 18. Even with mid-rolls, I'm still the best. Yeah, I only got a 10. Donald will go first. What do you want to do? Barack, don't listen. You don't know where I am. Did you say my name? Joe's snoring now. I couldn't hear you. It's fine. Just talk quietly. This table is big enough. If you talk softly, neither will hear the other. Can I make it to the opening? No, not with your base movement, but you could use a dash to get there, but that will take up your action so you won't have an attack. You will have a bonus action still, but you don't know where Barack is, so it probably won't be useful. Okay, I will use my dash and move just to the edge of the opening so that I am still covered by the tree line. I just want to be at the edge. Okay, is that your turn? Yeah, I'll end it there. Barack, your turn. What do you want to do? I want to cast Invisibility as a second level spell, move 30 feet, heading directly toward the center, and then end my turn. How close am I to the opening, Ben? About 20 more feet. You can easily get to the opening next turn if you wanted to. Donald, your turn again. God damn it, I can't think with Joe snoring. You think this is bad now? You should have heard him back when I was in office. All right, focus, Donatello. Sorry. All right. You know what? I am the greatest in all of Trumpville, and probably the world. I am not hiding like a coward. I move to the middle of the opening. Can I roll a perception check to see if I can find Barack, or at least know the basic direction he is in? Sure. Okay, I got an 11. These dice are rigged. You guys probably set this whole thing up just to try to show that Barack is stronger than me. All right, Barack, can you roll a stealth check? Sure. Do I have advantage because I'm stealthed? I'm going to say no on this one. You would have to be moving quietly through the forest. That's a 13. All right, Donatello, you hear movement coming from both the right and the left. He is to the right. I know it. I have the best intellect in all of Trumpville. Can I raise my crossbow to ready if he attacks me? Yeah, you can save your action to use it as a reaction in that case. I do that and end my turn. Barack, your turn. I will move 15 feet forward so I have a good look at the open area but still covered. I know I am invisible but want to play it safe. Do I see Donatello in the middle of the field? You see him with his back towards you, aiming a crossbow at the far side of the clearing. Guess nobody in Trumpville is that smart then. Okay, I want to cast Storm Sphere, so Donatello, you need to make a strength saving throw. And then for my bonus action, I'll throw a lightning bolt at him. God damn it, that's a natural one. You take nine points of damage from that, and then I'll attack you. Since you're in the sphere, I have advantage too. You're a coward, Barack. Why would I run out and fight you out there? That would only end badly for me. This is called strategy. It's like a drone strike. Holy hell, I just rolled double natural ones. Yeah, because I am the best. You literally couldn't hit me with advantage. All right, well, you also have disadvantage on perception checks while you're in the storm sphere, and it's difficult terrain. How big is the sphere again, Barack? It's a 20-foot radius, so 40 feet in total. This is so stupid. I'll end my turn there. All right, Donald, it's your turn then. I want to run as far as I can into the forest. I'll use my dash action too. Barack isn't invisible anymore, right? That's right. He can only maintain concentration on one spell at a time. All right, so it costs a total of 40 feet to get out of the storm, so I'm able to make it 20 feet outside of it if I dash. Can I then make a perception check to see if I can find him? Yeah, you can do that. Barack, I'll need you to roll stealth as well. That's a 10. Damn, only an eight for me. All right, Donatello, you see Barack standing just inside the forest, not more than 20 feet away from you. You aren't able to quite make it to him this turn though, since you already used all your movement. Yeah, fine, whatever, I'll end my turn then. It is basically over, next turn Obama will be dead. Don't be so sure, all right, first thing I will do is shoot another lightning bolt at him. That's a 19 for 11 damage. Then I'm going to try to break line of sight before casting invisibility again. God damn it, this is so annoying. You know you're dead once I catch you, Barack. Yeah, but I still have one more second level slot for another invisibility. And you're already down almost to half, yeah? You wish. All right, is it my turn then? Yeah, your turn. 
I want to run 30 feet in the direction I saw Barack running away in, and then make a perception check to try to find him. All right, roll for perception, and Barack, roll for stealth. That's a nine. That's a 13 for me. Damn it. All right, I'm going to use my other action to ready my crossbow again. All right, Barack, you're up again. I don't think I'll really get past your armor class, so I'm going to third level cast magic missile. So I'll launch five magic missiles at you, Donatello. That's a total of 22 damage then. I'll also enter Bladesong. But I don't want you to just call me a coward the whole time. So now that we are on more even footing, I'll move so that I am about 40 feet away. Yeah, after you already took me all the way down to less than 30 health. This was dumb. I demand a rematch in an environment better for me. Do I get my reaction shot with the crossbow? You were the one who ran out into the open Donatello. That definitely gave Barack the upper hand. You do get your reaction shot. Whatever. Damn, that's only a nine to hit, so that misses. All right, I'm then going to run and use my action to dash over to Barack, and then I'll use action surge to attack him twice. That's a 25 and a 16. What's your armor class, Barack? It's a 16, so both of those hit. Hell yeah, all right, that's 22 damage then. Damn, nice one. All right, my turn then? Not quite. I'm also going to use my second win to recover. Damn, only eight hit points. All right, your turn. All right, I'm gonna cast Lightning Bolt. That's so rigged. For Christ's sake, Donatello, you can't just say everything is rigged. You need to make a dexterity saving throw. That's a five. Damn, that's only 27 damage. You're at 36 right now, yeah? That's damn right I am. All right, is it my turn then? I think if I run away right now, it'd be my best chance at victory. But I'm okay with ending it here. I would have had you if I kept backing away and was smart about it. I just didn't want to be too cheap because then you'd say it didn't count. That's because it wouldn't have counted. All right, I'm going to attack you twice. Damn it, that's a 12 and a 21 for a total of 12 damage. So I win then, right? I have 18 health. I'll use my last turn to cast Magic Missile as a third level spell. That's 15 damage. All right, well played. I'll give you that one. I almost had you if I just didn't roll so terribly. We are on closer footing than I would have thought. That was a lot closer than I would have thought. You were definitely on a pretty big disadvantage, Donatello. In a 1v1 fight, I would say past level 5 fighters usually don't stand a chance against wizards, unless you can get in close fast enough. I am the greatest fighter in all of Trumpville. All right, well, this has been a fun time, guys. Even though I lost, I think it just goes to show that I truly am the greatest. I don't quite know your logic there, but that was a really good fight. Thanks for having that at the end, Ben. This has been a really good session. A lot happened for sure. Yeah, a lot definitely happened. Well, should we wake Joe up then? Oh no, he is out, practically in a coma for the next eight hours or so. But this is my house, he can't stay here. Relax, Ben, he'll just be chilling in his chair. Besides, a sleepover with Ben Shapiro and Joe Biden? Who wouldn't pay money to see that? Sorry, Ben, he'll probably be here until we put together our next movie. Thanks for joining, everyone. Like, share, and subscribe if you agree that fighters are the best and wizards are just a bunch of cowards. No, you should like, share, and subscribe if you agree that fighters are just weaklings and that wizards are truly the best class of D&D. All right, stay posted for our next movie on the channel and for the return of the presidential D&D campaign. Thanks for joining, everyone. We will see you all next time.